one way they can make titration calculations quite a bit trickier is to give you an unknown compound. Normally it's the metal in the carbonate or the hydroxide that will be unknown, but they could easily do it with an unknown acid as well and make you work out what the acid is. This doesn't make the calculation any difficult, any more difficult. It just adds an extra step on the end and it makes the question a bit wordy and a bit more confusing just to try and throw people off. But you're good enough not to get thrown off by these questions. You're good enough to read the question carefully and work out exactly what's going on. And you've already done this practical and required practical one. So hopefully anything I say here will make you think back to that practical when you were doing it. Nothing here should seem like a surprise. So a student has a carbonate compound, X2O, X2CO3. They weighed 1.9 grams of this carbonate and dissolved it in water to make a 250 centimetre cubed solution. Let's draw out what's actually going on here. So there is your carbonate, X2CO3. We're going to dissolve it in some water. And we've got 1.95 grams of it. We're then going to transfer it into a 250 centimetre cubed volumetric flask. So that also contains X2CO3, and we know the volume 250 centimetres cubed. Then we took out 25 centimetre cubed portions of it. So let's take out 25 centimetre cubed portions. You know that when you pipette that out, you always put it into the conical flask. So the conical flask is what contains the X2CO3. This time our volume is just 25 centimetres cubed. And we titrated it. Whenever you're doing titration, you're going to use a burette. So draw the burette. This is why practical work is so important to make you think what's going on. And that contains the HCl. And we know the concentration of that is 0.04. And we know that the value or the volume, 24.3 centimetres cubed, because that's what the concordant results are. They've told us in the question this time, so we don't even have to work it out ourselves. Right, so that's all the information. And again, if you want, you can actually just check it when you're in the exam. You've got a highlighter, just highlight everything. So all of the carbonate values I'll do in yellow. Again, I'll actually highlight them on here. So that's carbonate, that's carbonate, that's carbonate. And then choose a different color to do all the values about the HCl. So I'm just doing this as a check, but maybe if you were less confident going into this question, you might do this before drawing the diagram, working out what these values and then adding them onto your diagram. It doesn't really matter which way you do it. But I would suggest doing it some way. So, as with all amount of substance, what chemical do you know two things about? Because that's the chemical you can do a calculation with. I know two things about the hydrochloric acid. If you draw a diagram like this, it makes it really obvious which chemical you know two things about. So I've got concentration and a volume, therefore I can work out the number of moles of HCl. That's going to be concentration times volume. So 0.04. When I'm writing out the calculation, I don't care about significant figures, but when I do my final answer, I definitely will. My volume, 42.3. Don't forget to convert it into decimeters cubed, dividing it by 1,000. And you'll come up with 1.692. Times 10 to the minus 3 moles. And you know what? Add it onto your diagram because then you can see what you're up to. And also on your diagram, just say, I've used these two values. I'm going to tick that bit off because you hardly ever will ever have to go back to a bit you've already done a calculation with. I've used those two numbers. I'm not going to use them again. And because you've got a diagram, that's going to control where your next bit of information can go. So my chemicals will go from the burette into the conical flask. So that's where my next calculation is going to go. I know the number of moles in the burette. 
Therefore, I can do the ratio in the question to work out the moles in the conical flask. So the ratio of the chemical that I know, HCl, to the one that I don't know, the X2CO3, is 2 to 1. So my number of moles of X2CO3 is going to be the number of moles of HCl divided by 2. Because it's a 2 to 1 ratio, I'm going from 2 to 1. I have to divide 2 by 2 to get to 1. So I have to divide the number of moles of HCl by 2 to get to the moles of X2CO3. It's going to be 8.46 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. So I can add that to this diagram. Number of moles equals 8.46 times 10 to the minus 4. So where does my diagram go next? Well, it goes to the volumetric flask. But what bit of information do I have here? Well, I've got a volume in my conical flask. I've got a volume in my volumetric flask. Then I want to look at the ratio of those two volumes. So I'm going from 25 to 250. I have to times by 10. So my number of moles, I'm also going to have to times by 10 to work out how many moles are in my volumetric flask. So in the actual calculation bit, we can say we've worked out the moles in 25 centimetres cubed, but we want to go to 250 centimetres cubed. So you have to times it by 10. And you're going to get 8.46 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. In 270 meters cubed. If you've got everything in standard form, you don't, and I suggest you shouldn't, use a calculator to times by 10. Just add one onto the power. So minus 4 plus 1 takes you to minus 3. So now we know the number of moles in the volumetric flask 8.46 times 10 to the minus 3. Right. Now we can start the fun bit. We know that our mass of X2CO3 was 1.95 grams. We know that that made 8.46 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. So we can think, well, if we know that number of moles equals mass divided by molar mass, we can rearrange that. So the molar mass of X2CO3 is going to equal mass divided by number of moles. So 1.95 divided by the 8.46 times 10 to the minus 3. And that comes out as 230.5. So that is the molar mass of X2CO3. Let's go up here then. We don't want to know the molar mass of X2CO3. We want to work out what X is. So we can say that x2co3 basically equals 2 times x plus 1 times carbon which is 12 plus 3 times oxygen which is 16. They're the chemicals that make up x2co3 and we know that that is 230.5. So 2x is going to equal 230.5, take away 12, take away 48. And that comes out as 170.5. But we don't care what 2x is, we care what x is. So there, basically we've just taken away the carbonate. Here, we're dividing by 2. So the molar mass of x is 85.2. So you look on your periodic table, what element has a mass close to 85.2? And it comes out as rubidium. And then stop and just think, does that make sense? Well, we know that a carbonate ion is 2 minus, and that is being, or well, in an ionic compound with no charge, we need two x's to cancel it out. So what positive charges will cancel out a two minus charge? Well, we're going to have two separate one plus charges. So X must be in group one. And rubidium is in group one. So I think that makes logical sense. Wonderful.
if your answer wasn't in group one, you would just choose the group one element closest to the molar mass you've got. And that's how you identify the unknown metal.